In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters, peace be with you. And with your spirit. This morning we've gathered to celebrate the greatest prayer there is, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And as we begin this Mass, I would like to greet and thank in a special way his Eminence Sean Cardinal O'Malley, the Archbishop of Boston, who is our homilist. I'd like to thank also my brother bishops, priests, deacons, and seminarians who are with us today. How blessed we are with so many women and men religious, especially the Sisters of Life. And my special greetings to Sister Mary Concepta, the, who is... Um, the prioress. Also the Knights of Columbus, led by Patrick Kelly and his wife Vanessa, are many volunteers, but most especially, I greet you, our young people, who have come here to celebrate life, to give thanks for life from all parts of these United States. We are here to celebrate the one who is the source of life the one who has most clearly revealed our human dignity, the one who has redeemed us by the blood of his cross, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us ask now for the grace to celebrate these mysteries worthily. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words in what I have done and what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. God, our creator, we give thanks to you who alone have the power to impart the breath of life as you form each of us in our mother's womb. Grant, we pray, that we, whom you have made stewards of creation, may remain faithful to this sacred trust and constant in safeguarding the dignity of every human life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. reading from the first letter of St. John. We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God, and God in him. In this is love brought to perfection among us, that we have confidence on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And so one who fears is not yet perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For whoever does not love a brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. The word of the Lord.
Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Herod had died, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. He rose, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, was, who was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go back there. And because he had been warned in a dream, he departed for the region of Galilee. He went and dwelt in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Archbishop Laurie, dear sisters of life, Knights of Columbus, brothers and sisters all, it is such a joy to be here today with all of you. The snow is a special blessing. It gives us an opportunity to give an even more striking witness to our commitment to life. Thank you, especially the young people that are here today. When I was about five or six years old, my grandfather gave us a wonderful gift for Christmas. It was a television set. It was the first television set in our neighborhood. We had never seen one before. It was about the size of a refrigerator and it had a six inch screen <laughs> and there was one channel in black and white. You had to turn a button to make it go on and off. And in those early days of television, there was a program called The Millionaire. And the storyline was this philanthropist would send his assistant, Mr. Anthony, out with a check for a million dollars that he would give to some family or individual. And then the story was what happened to them after they got all that money. And usually their lives became unraveled. But you know what always intrigued me, even as a child, about that program was no one ever seemed very curious about where all that money came from. They were very happy to take that check and run. But you know, so often we too are like that. We can become so fascinated with the gifts that we forget about the giver of all good gifts. We are here because our loving God gave us the gift of life. This Mass we celebrate is in thanksgiving for the gift of life. Our God loves us so much. Not only does He give us life, He gives us His life. He makes a gift of Himself to us in the Eucharist so that we can be nurtured in love, so that we can also make a gift of ourselves to God and to one another. I remember back here in Washington, 1963, Reverend Martin Luther King inspired millions of people throughout the world with his speech, I have a dream. Pope Francis has said to young people so many times, live and dream. We must dream together 
of a better world. Dreams are seldom realized overnight, but they point us in a direction and encourage us to make a journey. In today's gospel, St. Matthew talks to us about St. Joseph's dream. I've always said this gospel is a great consolation to preachers. When I was bishop in Palm Beach, I visited a parish one day, the first time I'd been in that church, and I said to the pastor, what was the capacity of your church? He said, Bishop, my church sleeps 700. <laughs> the good news is, God can talk to us even when we're asleep. God spoke to Joseph various times in the gospel through dreams. And each time, Joseph's life was completely upended, and he courageously and generously embraced God's will as manifested in the dream. In today's dream, Joseph is told that Herod is dead. Herod, the man who had decreed gender-selective elimination of all male children under 24 months in Bethlehem. You know, today in China, there are 30 million young men who will never be able to get married and have a family because for years they had the one-child policy that resulted in the elimination of girl babies. 30 million abortions of girls that have left the population completely lopsided. You know, a half a century ago, Nellie Gray, founder of the Pro-Life March, had a dream. Her dream was that the Herodian Roe versus Ways decision that sentenced 60 million innocent children to death would one day be cast into the dustbin of history. Nellie renounced her career. She was a young lawyer working at the Labor Department here. She dedicated her whole life to the defense of the unborn. She made a gift of herself. We have lived to see Roe versus Wade negated. And this is because of her inspiration and her dream. We're still here, and as the challenge of protecting the lives of unborn children has shifted to our states, our work must continue. In 1975, Reverend Jesse Jackson connected the dots between slavery and abortion. He said, there are those who argue that the right to privacy is of a higher order than the right to life. So that was the premise of slavery. You couldn't protest the existence or treatment of slaves on the plantation because that was private and therefore outside of your right to be concerned. Oh, the parallels between abortion and slavery are many. Both institutions have devalued human life and dignity, and have caused great divisions in our country. Today we have another opportunity to underscore the unique value of human life in all its station, stages and reaffirm the basic rights of life and the fundamental duty not to kill. Today's scientific knowledge allows us to see with clarity that the embryo is not merely a cluster of cells with potential, but rather a distinct human being that comes into existence and conception and every single stage of one's biological life, 
from infancy to child to the middle age and beyond, is part of a continuous process that begins in the womb. We are all former embryos. We know that legal restrictions are not enough to end abortion, but that many unborn lives are saved when the laws are just. Tragically, even after Roe versus Wade was overturned, far too many children are lost by what are falsely billed as the protection of human liberties, though very notable, not the liberties of the unborn child. The basic question is, do we believe that human beings have value and should be protected? Or are they disposable when they're defective, unwanted, inconvenient, of the wrong race, the wrong sex? The eugenic aspect of abortion is often camouflaged by platitudes like choice and privacy. It's naive to think that Abortion doesn't desensitize our nation. This is what Pope Francis is talking about when he talks of the globalization of indifference, a society that is prepared to eliminate unborn children has to be affected in their attitude towards the vulnerable, the defenseless, the welfare of the nameless and faceless who have become as invisible as Lazarus in the parable on the rich man's porch. The pandemic of recent years unmasked the many terrible inequities that exist in our society, in our world. The poor and the minorities have less access to health care, education, housing, sometimes even justice in the courts. Despite being less than one-third of the population, blacks and Hispanics account for two-thirds of all abortions performed. In New York City, over half of the black babies are aborted. The pressure on these women is horrific. Help comes too late and too little. In Joseph's dream about the death of Herod is not the end of the story. Joseph had to wake up to a new reality and make a difficult journey home. Dismantling unjust laws are only the beginning. We still have the arduous task of creating a pro-life culture, of changing people's minds and hearts. If exponents of the pro-life movement come across as judgmental or self-righteous, we will not be heard. People will believe us only when they are convinced that we care about them. People will believe us only when they are convinced that we love them. Our task is not to judge others, but to try and bring healing. Jesus saves his indignation for the Pharisees and the hypocrites, but he's very gentle with the Samaritan woman, the poor, the tax collector, the adulterous woman, and the good thief. Our task is to build a society that takes care of everybody, where every person counts, where every life is important. Political polarization, racism, economic just injustice will all continue to fuel abortion in a post-Roe versus Wade world. Recently, I heard the story of a man who wanted to get a new pair of trousers. And he went to a very famous Jewish tailor. He picked out the cloth, the design, and every week he would come back 
to pick up the trousers, and they were never ready. After three months, finally, the tailor gave him his trousers. And the man knew that the tailor was very pious, and he said to him, you know, God made the world in a week, and it took you three months to make these trousers. You know what the tailor said? He said, yes. He said, but look at the trousers. He said, they're beautiful. He said, look at the world. It's a mess. <laughs> the world is a mess today. But you know, the Jews have a beautiful concept. They talk about tikkun olam, which means God has placed us here to repair the world. In Catholic terminology, we talk about building a civilization of love. The first reading from today's Mass, taken from the letter of John, speaks about love. John reminds us that God loves us first, and Jesus wants us to love in the same way. We must learn to love first, not wait till people love us and then reciprocate. God loves us while we're still in sin. We must learn to love first, to forgive first, to give first. It's that kind of love that creates a culture of life, whereas Pope Francis urges us in the prayer at the end of Fratelli Tutti to discover anew that all, all are important and all are necessary. They tell the story of a man who went to the doctors because he was sick and had all these tests made. And, and the doctor asked to talk to the man's wife. And he said, your husband is very sick and he is going to survive only if you take very good care of him. And the woman said, what do you mean, doctor? He said, well, prepare his favorite food for him. Let him go hunting and fishing with his buddies. Don't ask him to take out the garbage or shovel the snow or cut the grass. And let him have the remote control for the television set. Don't invite his mother-in-law over too often. And if you do all these things, if you take really good care of him, he's going to survive. He's going to get well. Well, coming home in the car, the man was very worried. And he said to his wife, what did the doctor say? What did the doctor say? She said, honey, the doctor said you're going to die. <laughs> you know, Pope Francis is always telling us, God put us on this world to take care of each other. And if we don't do that, the patient is going to die. Most abortions are performed on unmarried women in poverty. Being pro-life means working tirelessly for economic justice in our country. A land where the rich grow richer and the poor grow poorer will always be fertile soil for abortion. We have to learn to think outside the box. America came up with the Marshall Plan to rescue Europe after the war. What are we doing for the disenfranchised in our own country? The irony is that each year in America, Two million Americans want to adopt a child, and only about 20,000 U.S. babies are given in adoption. At the same time, countless babies are aborted. It's tragic that women in crisis have come to see adoption as the least acceptable option when confronted with a difficult and unwanted pregnancy. Only a huge educational effort will be able to change the cultural prejudices that exist. 
I was very touched when recently one of my priests, one of my pastors came to me, and he told me that he had been adopted as a child into a loving family that nurtured his faith and his vocation. And in the last year, he came to discover who his birth mother was and met her and established a relationship with her. And this year, he buried both his mom who raised him and his birth mother who had given him an adoption. In the last months before these two women died, they both made a similar request of their priest's son. His mother who raised him told her son she wanted to meet the birth mother. When he asked her why, she said, I just want to say thank you. Almost simultaneously, his birth mother made a similar request. She wanted to meet his adoptive mother. And he said, why? And she too said, I just want to thank her. As a church and a society, we must learn to say thank you to those courageous women who are unable to raise a child themselves, yet willing to entrust that child to a loving family. And we need to celebrate the generosity and love of those adoptive families that receive these children and make a place for them at the table of life. Christ commands us, judge not lest you be judged. Rather, he commands us to love and to care for each other. None of us know how we would react if we were in the circumstances of the woman who has chosen abortion as a way out. Almost one in four of American women will have an abortion by the time they reach 40 years of age. Society has failed them. We have failed them. In recent years, Project Rachel, Walking with Moms, are good examples of how we're trying to reach out to so many women who've had an abortion, who are considering one, and provide them with meaningful assistance and support. I don't know whether you young people know who Dorothy Day was. She'll probably be the next American saint. Her cause has been introduced for canonization. When I was a young friar, uh, she used to come to Washington to the soup kitchen of Catholic Worker, and we'd meet her there. And uh, She was a person who's always inspired so many in our country. Pope Francis, when he came to the United States, spoke about her. As a young woman, she had a great passion for social justice. It led her to even join the Communist Party, thinking the revolution was the way to find justice in society. In her young years, she took a lover, had a child out of wedlock, had an abortion. But she eventually found the light of Christ, entered the church, and founded the Catholic Worker Movement. She dedicated her whole life to taking care of addicts and the poor. She truly made a gift of herself. But you know what she said shortly after the Roe versus Wade decision was handed down? She made a statement denouncing the Supreme Court for depriving the unborn of any protection. But she went on to say, we welcome the energetic leadership of our bishops who are giving in the abortion controversy and we're proud to join our voices to theirs. But at the same time, we have to point out that ultimately the sincerity of our words and theirs on any of these issues will be measured by our readiness to recognize and deal with the underlying social problems which turn many people to these deadly alternatives, Con to condemn all forms 
of economic injustice and work for the elimination of all of these injustices that cause people to fall into abortion. Yes, changing the laws is essential. But more than changing laws, we have to change hearts to build a civilization of love that will ultimately overcome abortion. The journey back after Herod's death must be a renewed commitment to the social gospel, to human rights and economic justice in a civilization of love. We need to overcome the globalization of indifference to repair the world. I want to end with a, one of my favorite parables that the Japanese tell. They tell the story of a man who lived in a magnificent home on the top of a mountain. And each day, he would go out and take a walk and look at the sea down below. And one day as he was out walking, he saw a group of his neighbors were having a picnic. And then he saw this huge tsunami that was coming toward the shore. He wanted to warn his neighbors. He began to wave his arms and shout. But they were too far away. They couldn't see him. They couldn't hear him. So you know what that man did? He went into his beautiful home and he set it on fire. And when his neighbors looked up and saw the flames, they said, let's climb the mountain, help our neighbor save his home. But some of the people said, oh, that mountain is so steep and we're having so much fun. You go. Well, the ones who climbed the mountain to help their neighbor were saved. And those who say, stayed on the beach having fun when the tidal wave hit the shore were swept out to sea and perished. Sometimes when we perform a work of mercy or an act of justice, we think we're doing God a favor. But actually, we're climbing that mountain of love. We're helping to build a new civilization. And in protecting life, we are protecting even ourselves. Today, I urge all of you, my brothers and sisters, climb that mountain of love. Make a gift of yourselves. Repair the world. God bless you. God is the giver of all life, human and divine. With confidence and trust, let us offer to him our prayers and our petitions. We pray for our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for Cardinal Gregory, Cardinal O'Malley, Bishop Lori, and all bishops and priests. May they be inflamed in the power of the Holy Spirit and proclaim the gospel of life with courage and love we pray to the Lord. Lord we pray for all those serving in public office. May they be transformed by the Lord of life and enact laws that preserve the sacredness of every human life. May our nation usher in a new era of protection for the unborn and work to build a culture where every person is valued. We pray to the Lord. We pray for all women who are pregnant and tempted to abortion. May they know the gift of their lives and receive the grace to choose life for their children. May they be surrounded by love and support. And may all fathers be inspired to protect and care for new life. We pray to the Lord. 
We pray for all those who are suffering after abortion. May the tender and healing mercy of Jesus flood their hearts, bringing hope and making all things new in him. We pray to the Lord. We pray for all who will attend the March for Life today and for all who strive to build a culture of life. May we be renewed in the gift of every human life, filled with the enduring hope and real joy found in Jesus Christ, and so become agents of healing in our nation and in our world. We pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord of life and love, we ask you to pour forth your spirit into our hearts that we may bear courageous witness to the value of every human life and that we might also generously serve those in need, thus building up a culture of life and a civilization of love. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord.
pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. Accept our humble offerings, O Lord of the living, and unite us to the perfect sacrifice of your Son, through whom you have made all creation new, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body, we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church 
spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, me, your unworthy servant, Wilton, my brother, the bishop of this place, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from me. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace be with you. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word.
to the right of the altar stage area.
let us pray. Increase your love within us, Lord God, by the savoring mysteries we have celebrated and bring people everywhere to respect your gift of human life through Christ our Lord. Amen. My dear friends, as we conclude today's celebration, it is appropriate to call upon Our Lady of Guadalupe, the patroness of the unborn, and entrust our efforts to defend human life to her intercession. Our work to establish a world where every life is valued and supported from conception until natural death does not stop here. No, we must go forth with the aid of Our Lady and continue to build the civilization of truth and love that we are called to establish as followers of Christ. And so let us pray. O Mary, bright dawn of the new world, mother of the living, to you do we entrust the cause of life. Look down, O mother, upon the vast numbers of babies not allowed to be born, of the poor whose lives are made difficult, of men and women who are victims of brutal violence, of the elderly and the sick killed by indifference or out of misguided mercy. Grant that all who believe in your Son may proclaim the gospel of life with honesty and love to the people of our time. Obtain for them the grace to accept that gospel as a gift ever new, the joy of celebrating it with gratitude throughout their lives, and the courage to bear witness to it resolutely in order to build, together with all people of goodwill, the civilization of truth and love to the praise and glory of God, the creator and lover of human. And now I would invite everyone to join me in the consecration to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Our Lady of Guadalupe, by saying yes to God's gift of life, you brought to life to the world. May I, like you, always be prepared to accept the gift of new life. You who told us that you would be our mother, always keep me close to your motherly heart. May all the sons and daughters of this great land, yet to be born, always be welcomed and protected. O Virgin Mary, you who are the Immaculate Tabernacle of the Sacramental Jesus, today I consecrate myself entirely to you. I will defend human life from conception until the moment when our Lord calls each person to his prayer. The Lord be with you. Bow your head and pray for God's blessing. May God, who in Christ has shown us his truth and love, make you messengers of the gospel of life and witnesses to the divine love before all the world. Amen. May the Lord Jesus Christ, who came that we might have life more abundantly, open your hearts to accept and nurture life in every stage and condition. Amen. May the Spirit of the Lord be upon you, enabling you courageously to defend life. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be.